Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared to them and the Lord spoke to Moses saying take the staff and assemble the congregation you and Aaron your brother and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water so you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle and Moses took the staff from the Lord as he commanded him then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. The word of God for the people of God. God. So, as we read from the scriptures this morning, I'll give you all some time to get down before I get rolling. We are in the book of Numbers 20, verses 1 through 13. Um, and how many of you are familiar with this story? The story where Moses strikes the rock. He, he doesn't do what God has instructed. It's a, it's a very you know, common passage. Uh, and before we kind of get into the passage of Scripture, I kind of want to talk about, I think, stuff that we all wrestle with and we struggle with. So I asked the question to children earlier, and I guaranteed they would all say yes. I think they will all say yes to this question. Uh, or no, because I, I worded it this way. How many of you have never been impatient? Right? No. So how many of you have never been impatient? Right? So I'm an impatient person. Uh, and my wife's sitting right over there. She can, you can ask her and she'll be like, yeah, he's pretty impatient. So, so we all have moments of impatience. How many of you have moments of impatience when you're driving? Like, have you ever had to go through Atlanta traffic? That's the worst, right? It's, it drives me crazy. I just want to get where I'm going. Uh, maybe it's not just like little moments of impatience, but maybe it's like, maybe you have seasons in your life or moments in your life, and I think we all have been there, where we would like to be done with it. We would like to get out of those seasons in life. Like we don't want to be there, right? So we've all had moments and we've had seasons of life that maybe we wanted to be done with, that we wanted to get through. And what I have found in my life, and I think this is true for all of us, so I think we all struggle with this, is that impatience oftentimes leads to frustration, right? We get frustrated. And impatience and frustration, they go hand in hand. And a lot of times, impatience, this is really big, I think, comes from thinking that we know what we want, or it comes from wanting to control how something happens. This is desire for control. There's this desire to like be able to control the moments we're in, the seasons that we're in, the things that are happening around us. And here's what I think is true. Our desire to have control, that control that we, we all want. We all want to control every part of our lives, every part of our day. The reason that we have that desire for control, it's rooted in what we think is best for ourselves. Think about that for a moment. What we think is best for ourselves, our desire to control life is rooted in what we think is best for me, for I, and for what I want in that very moment. And the question that we should ask is if I want control, if I desire control, 
then what is it that I trust the most? What do I trust the most if I really desire to have control? And the answer to that question is revealed when we lose control and become frustrated and impatient. The thing that we trust the most is revealed to us when we don't have control, when we are impatient, when we are having to like, deal with the things that are happening and we would like them to be different or we would like to get through it. For me in my life, I've had many seasons where I wanted to be done. So I went to Shorter University uh, right up the road in Rome, Georgia. Uh, and while I was working there, I, or going to school there, I began to work uh, at a restaurant called D uh, Doug's Deli. I don't know if any of you have been there. If you get the chance, it's really good food. Um, but I worked there, and the first job that I got there, I was the dish boy. So I, I worked in the dish pit. Uh, and so back in the dish pit, they would bring dishes back there. And I wasn't blessed enough to have like the machine that you have where you get to put it in there and you bring it down, you press the button, you hang out for a little while and you take everything out. No, I would have these piles of dishes and it would all be hand washed. So I would wash everything by hand. So I would go, I would leave. Um, I had a first and second Kings class at 10 o'clock. I would go to work at 11 and I would wash dishes from around 11. I'd get like a 30 minute, sometimes 30 minute lunch break and then I'd go back and I would leave around 4 30 and that was just washing dishes and then eventually I kind of got to work my way up I got to make some sandwiches here and there and then I got to like be the delivery guy that was the best getting to be the delivery guy was because you get to leave and I would like listen to my music or podcasts or books or whatever and I that was that wasn't too bad so uh, I enjoyed working there when I was in college it was it was fine it was a job I, it helped me kind of have some extra money here and there um, but when I graduated you know I kind of had this idea that when I went to college I'd get my degree, I'd graduate, and then I would be right in the real, real world. I'd get a full-time job. I'd get everything that I'd want. I'd have control, right? I'd be able to control all of my life, right? So I ended up graduating, and I ended up not, I didn't get a full-time job. I ended up working, I was working part-time at a church, which was a blessing, but I was still working at the deli. And uh, over the course of time, I grew kind of frustrated because it was like, and I went to college, I mean, I, I did the education. Um, I began to really kind of grow resentful towards this job uh, and because I thought that I deserved better. Right? In those moments, I was like, I deserve better than this. I should have like a full-time job. I should have something that's good. And I grew frustrated at my life. For me, that was a moment and that was a season in my life that at the time it was really difficult. It was really hard at the time because um, when I had graduated from college, I had gone from being with uh, this, all my friends in college and then we all kind of you know, dispersed and we all did our own things. And so I was now in the real world, but I wasn't in the situation that I wanted to be in. And I wasn't in the situation that I thought was best for me, right? And so I grew impatient and I grew frustrated and I grew aggravated. And these moments like of frustration, they, they often reflect what we place our trust in. Like I said earlier, what, what we like place our trust in is revealed when we are impatient and when we're frustrated. And this is the nature of all of us. This is the nature of humanity. This is how we operate. And so with that in mind, the passage in Numbers we're looking at today, it reflects people, a people group, who have grown impatient, frustrated, and they desire control. They want control. So I'll read Numbers 21 through 13 once again. And I just want you to listen specifically when I read through this. Hear the gripes of the Israel people. And, and just take those to heart. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. There Miriam died and was buried, and now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness, that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs or grapevines, or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent meeting and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, Take your staff, and you and your brother and Aaron, gather the assembly together, speak to that rock before their eyes, 
and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink it. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence. Just as he commanded him, he and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm, struck the rock twice with his staff, Water gushed out in the community, and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. These were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord, and where he proved holy among them. So this is an interesting passage. But the question I want to ask is, how in the world did we get here, right? So how did we get to this place? So the book of Numbers is a really fascinating book. Um, I, I really enjoy learning about like the background of, of books of the Bible and things like that. But the book of Numbers in the Hebrew Bible is actually, it's this word and it's called Bamidbar. You want to say that with me? Bamidbar. Right? So this this word meaning in the wilderness or in the desert. So when we read it, we read numbers, but this, this book is really telling the story of the Israelite people receiving the, the law from, from God, from Yahweh at Mount Sinai, and then him assembling them to go forth and be a part of the final portion of the covenant that God had promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The, this book follows after Israel has been given the law at Mount Sinai. And as they're given this law, everything is going well. Everything's going good. Um, they're there, and they have received the law, uh, and they are going to go forward. There's this faithfulness. They're, they're confident. They're ready to go. And, and, and we read through this, Numbers 1 through 10. There's this confidence of the Israelite people, Moses and Aaron. They're ready to go. And in Numbers 10, the Israel people are organized. They're led by God's Spirit. And the Ark of the Covenant, they head to the land that God had promised. He tells them, go to Canaan. And I will instruct you how to take the land, and we find out later that they don't do a very good job of being obedient to that. And it's here that the last portion that the covenant that God made with Abraham is to be fulfilled. If you remember, as we're reading through the scriptures in Genesis, God chose Abraham. He made a promise. He says, I'm going to give you many, many people. I'm going to bless and I'm going to redeem you. And I'm going to give you a land that your people will call their own. And so they're called to go to this land. This is the final thing, and these people get to be a part of it. And immediately... In Numbers 11, things go haywire, right? Immediately there begins this pattern of rebellion and frustration in Numbers 11. If you want to later, if you want to write this down, Numbers 11, 1, they begin to complain. So literally the verse after Numbers 10, they're ready to go, right? As Numbers 11, 1 begins, they begin to complain about the things that they do not have. They begin to complain about the things they can't control. They begin to complain about, oh, we don't have enough food, or we don't have water. We don't, why are you taking us here? And these complaints begin. There's a pattern of seven rebellions in the book of Numbers, leading from Numbers 11.1, 11, 11.4, 1, verses 12.1, chapters 14, 1 through 2, 16, 1 through 3, 16.41, Numbers 23, where what we are reading today, and then Numbers 21.5. There are these seven rebellions of the Israelite people, and they are in the wilderness. The, the way God is bringing about his faithfulness and promise to Israel is not what Israel thought was best for them. So you see, God is taking them to this land, this final promise of the covenant that's been given, and the Israelite people cannot seem to get past their short-sightedness of what's in front of them and keep in mind the promise that God has made to his people to provide to give them this land, to give them something good. But what they can only think about is where they are at in this moment, this moment of frustration, this moment of hardship, this moment where they don't have the good things that they had in Egypt. And it says there, we don't have, we don't have figs. We don't have grapevines. We don't have pomegranates. And there's no water to drink. The absurdity of these people to say this, because if we look back in Exodus 2.23, we see that God heard the cry of the Israelite people. It says in Exodus 2.23, During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. So they've forgotten where they were. 
where they were at, where they've been brought from. And in our passage today, we find another moment of Israel's complaints and Moses and Aaron respond. So let's look at this passage really quickly and kind of observe what's happening here. And then let's look at what this means for us today. In verses 2 through 5, and I'm just going to kind of highlight a few portions. So we begin with Israel complaining. As we've noticed, that Israel is a complaining bunch. And it says this, there was no water for the community, and the people gathered and they opposed Moses. Israel begins to complain once again, even asking, why were we brought out of Egypt? And think about that for a moment. They were slaves in Egypt, and now they're questioning would it not be just better to go back? And this is not the first time that they ask this question. We see this in Exodus, right before they're about to cross the Red Sea. They're asking, they're asking Moses, why did you bring us here just to die at the hands of the Egyptians and Pharaoh and his armies? And, and what does God do? He delivers them once again. He provides once again. And even after that question, we see more complaining. They've forgotten how God has been with them. They've forgotten where, how God has guided them from Egypt through the, the lands where they were at, where they felt like they were going to be trapped and killed by uh, uh, the Pharaoh. And Israel is continuing, again, I want us to really notice this. They're continuing to think through the lens of what they think is best for themselves. They're continuing to think through what is best for us now. Well, what is best for us now is we don't have figs, we don't have pomegranates, we don't have water. Why did you bring us here? Why didn't you just let us die in, in Egypt? Wouldn't it have been better to die in Egypt? Their desire is that, that their, for their present struggle to be resolved. But, but God has a different way of doing things. And even in the midst of where God had been with them, their present pain blinded them. It blinded them from where God had brought them and what God was trying to take them to, where God was trying to bring them to in this place of Canaan, this promised land. So we begin by Israel having these complaints. They're wondering, why did you bring us here? Why are we in this place? It would not have been better to die in Egypt. The second is then Moses and Aaron, they hear the complaints and the cries of the Israelite people. And you gotta, you gotta feel for Moses and Aaron because they gotta be getting fed up with these people. Like there's seven rebellions and it's like, what more can we do for you? What more can God do for you than show you that he is with you even when it doesn't seem like he's there? And so then God gives instruction, and God is very specific in his instruction. He says, take the staff, and you and your brother gather the assembly. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. And we should be reminded that God continues faithfulness toward Israel, even in their rebellion. I told the children that. That's so true for us as well. Right? God is continuing to show faithfulness. In these seven rebellions, God could have immediately ended it. But he let them time after time after time again continue to complain, and he continued to provide, and he continued to guide them, and he continued to lead them. Seven complaints. Now, I, I know that I, I complained a lot as a child, and so I feel like my parents probably really grew frustrated with me when I would complain or whine about things. And, and can you imagine the provision that God has given these people, and yet they continue to complain? And Moses and Aaron, they go before God face down. God gives clear instructions. And one thing to notice, a lot of people question this passage of like, why? When this is kind of a harsh punishment for Moses and Aaron. But there's a pattern in the Old Testament that we see where God gives specific and clear instructions. And why does he give those specific and clear instructions? He's asking for trust by his people. And an, obedience, an, an obedient heart and obedient actions reflects that trust. And so God tells them to take the staff, to gather the assembly, and speak to the rock. And then this last portion of this passage, verses 9 through 13, Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his, raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. So Moses at this point is fed up, even to the point that he kind of grows in, in, it seems like, some pride and some arrogance. And he's so angry, and he says, listen, you rebels. And what does he say? God is going to bring you water? No. He says, must we bring you water? Must we, must we be the ones who do this? 
And I'm sure God's probably like, no, <laughs> it ain't you, it's me. And so Moses has an attitude issue here, and he has disobedience. His attitude is, must we? Who does he give credit to? He gives credit to himself and Aaron, and God, I'm sure, is not happy with that. And then he's disobedient. What were the instructions? Take the staff, gather the assembly, and speak to the rock. What does he do? He takes the staff, he gathers the assembly, and he strikes the rock. And so Moses misses what he's told to do. In all of these rebellions, and in all of the book of Numbers, I mentioned earlier that word, this book is in the wilderness, in the desert. I think it's a beautiful book of the Bible. Because what we can take from this story is that Israel is in this wilderness, and they are blinded by the present circumstances, and the things that they're going through, and the things that they're dealing with. And in the wilderness, they became blind and forgot where God had brought them from. I read those verses earlier out of Exodus. It said that God heard their cry. He heard them. He was with them. And throughout, like, Scripture, we see time and time again that God hears the cry of His people, and He provides. And so they had become invested in what was best for themselves rather than what God had for them. Even though the circumstances that they were in were difficult, were hard, and it was not always easy, but God had a plan, and they did not have trust. They grew impatient, and they grew frustrated because they did not have control. And the book of Numbers, this book of being in the wilderness, is really interesting because I think it speaks to us and our humanity, and it speaks to our desire for control, and often our times to be in rebellion and disobedience, even though we can point to moments in our lives where God has spoken to us, where God has revealed himself to us, where God has shown us things, where God has provided for us. And what does this story mean for you and I, right? That's what we, that's what we come here for. What does this mean for you and I? I think it's easy to read these, these stories, these seven rebellions. If you want to go back and read them, they're all pretty absurd. And think, oh, I would never do that. I would never be like the people of Israel. But how often are we people of impatience and wanting what is best for us now, today? Like that story I told earlier. I wanted, to, I wanted a job. I, wanted, I didn't want to be washing dishes. I didn't want to be delivering food. I wanted to be doing something else. But it, it took time. And it wasn't meant for me in that moment. And so we often are thinking of what is best for us. And so what I want us to do, and when we read these stories, as we're reading through the scriptures this year, the Old Testament sometimes can be a lot, and it can be confusing. But I think the question that we need to ask is, is how did these stories speak to my humanity? How do they speak to my brokenness? How do they speak to, like, calling me towards following Jesus and following God better? And these stories, sometimes they seem absurd and they seem crazy because the amount of rebellion that we see and the amount of craziness that the Israelites bring themselves into, but that's the point. The point is when we read them is it, it's often like looking into a mirror. When we read the scriptures, I have a mirror here, we should be able to see ourselves in these stories at times. Now, that doesn't mean that these stories are about us. This doesn't, doesn't mean that these stories are about like, anything that have to do with like, us getting glory or anything like that. But what these stories do is they reflect back to us our brokenness, the places where we're missing it, and the places where God is calling us further into obedience. And so this story of rebellion, it shows us that we are like the Israelite people very often. We lose sight of where God has brought us from. So what I want to ask is, where are the places in your life that you are like Israel? Where are the places in your life that you are like Israel? Where are you, where are you short-sighted? Where have you forgotten your Exodus moments, right? Where have you forgotten where God has brought you from? Where is your desire for control leading you to your own downfall? Because here's what's beautiful about these stories is that God allowed them to choose what they decided to do, even if it led to their downfall. Because what we see later on in Numbers is that eventually they get to the land of Canaan, and Moses instructs spies to be sent into the land, and only two spies come back saying, we can do this. And guess what happens? The Israelite people do not hear the two spies. They hear the rest of them. And what happens is the Israelite people refuse to go into this land. 
So a whole generation of Israelite people who are supposed to see the promise of God and the covenant of his people fulfilled, miss it. And what's really interesting about this journey that they go on, if you look at a map, it takes two weeks to make this journey. It took the Israelite people 40 years because of their short-sightedness and their missing where God had brought them from. And so where, is, where are you like Israel? Where is your desire, desire for control leading to your own downfall? And I'll close with this. Faith. The idea of faith is not certainty. It's not certainty. Faith is trust in moments of wilderness, in uncertainty. And it is in these moments where God speaks his loudest, but we often find difficulty hearing. May we not be deafened by the things that are going on around us, but may we find where God is speaking to us and calling us to, and may we allow stories like these to nudge us and move us to a newer and deeper level of trust as we find moments in life where we journey through our own wilderness. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for your love uh, and your mercy, God. I just ask that we would, uh, we would see ourselves sometimes in the scriptures where we miss what you have called us to. I just ask that you would show us continually who you are and your love and your mercy. I pray we would have open ears and hearts to where you want to take us. Jesus, we thank you for your love. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.